We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all participants in the OCD Open Forum at uh, IGF 2021. Great to see you all. And there seems also there is a room in Poland, one participant in the physical uh, venue. Otherwise, we are a global community here. Uh, my name is Bengt Mollerud. Uh, I'm from the Swedish Post and Telecom Authority, PTS, and I'm also designated chair of the OECD Working Party on Communication Infrastructure and Service Policies. I will moderate now the first half of this open forum, of this, uh, this session. It is with thanks to communication technologies that we can hold this open forum in a hybrid format. The OECD recommendation on broadband connectivity addresses exactly this important aspect of digitalization. It aims at extending broadband services and improve quality of services. Today, we will explore uh, the recommendation on broadband connectivity and the crucial role of connectivity in the first half of this open forum. We have an impressive panelist today from the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication in Japan, Mr. Akiko Sakathi, and we have from the Ministry of Communication in Brazil, Mr. Daniel uh, Cavalcanti. And uh, we have from the private sector, Ms. Sim uh, Oladin Soltra. We also look forward to discussing uh, with the audience, and we therefore invite you to raise questions and share thoughts on this important topic. Please raise your Zoom hand uh, to post any question or write questions in the chat. We will follow that very closely. We will then read them out uh, so, to our speakers and we're going through this through the session. Let me now uh, jump right into the interventions and welcome Mr. Aki Sakaki, Director of Multilateral Economic Affairs, Office Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication in Japan. Dear Aki, how can policy and regulation in Japan unleash the full potential of connectivity for the digital transformation and ensure equal access to connectivity for all? Please, Aki, you have the floor. Thank you, Ben. Um, thank you for the introduction. Hello, this is Aki Kusasaki, Director of Ministry of Internet Affairs and Communications Japan. Um, first, I would like to thank IGF and OECD and all other people who make it possible to organize this forum, and I am honored to be a panelist today. Today's topic is important as reliable and affordable broadband is essential, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm excited to share our experience, which are in harmony with OECD's broadband recommendation, and to discuss what we could do to promote digital transformation and ensure equal access to all. Next page, please. To begin with, I will give you an overview of broadband service in Japan. As you may know, Japan is facing geographic and social challenges that causes difficulties in sustaining all kinds of services. Although in such a situation, people are using optic fibers and advanced wires as primary sources for broadband access as shown in the graph below, and the nationwide coverage rate for ultra or high speed band broadband is almost 100% here, indicated in, as a red uh, uh, word. To foster investment and innovation to disseminate broadband nationwide, Japan has been modernizing regulation for telecom services to facilitate fair competition and to ensure consumer benefits. For example, by simplified licensing procedures to registration or notification, impose open access to essential facilities, and promoted fair competition so that everyone can enjoy affordable prices and non discriminatory conditions. In principle, carriers have installed networks with fair competition. However, in non-profitable rural areas, 
the government has been implementing initiatives to support network installation. Next page, please. So the latest comprehensive initiative we took is called the Master Plan on the Regional Development of ICT Infrastructure. MIC released the first master plan on June 2019 and set a long-term roadmap to visualize actions and goals to promote populace indicated here. So far, we've completed some measures, including radio uh, wave propagation in super express tunnels and set an ambitious goal uh, to develop 5G base stations up to 280,000 by the end of fiscal year 2023, which is four times larger than originally planned by major carriers. To implement the plan, we are conducting a couple of measures to promote nationwide dissemination of 5G network, including secure and open system called Open RAN, which will be enhanced competition among vendor suppliers and established resilient sub supply chain. We are also promoting use cases for private, private 5G network or local 5G to be widely adopted in rural areas. Next page, please. So local 5G, is a system that allows entities such as uh, local companies, governments to build access spots and uh, flexible networking within their premises based on their needs. MIC has been promoting this uh, network with field trials to create new values and technical standards and promote digital transformation. Last year, we had 90 cases and developed rules and guidelines for local 5G in various environments, such as uh, agricultural, healthcare, and manufacturing. Next page, please. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We are also aiming to reduce unserved households for optic fibers to 170,000 by the end of this fiscal year. To achieve this goal, we are offering subsidy for installation costs to local governments and telecom carriers to develop ICT infrastructure in designated disadvantageous areas with a certain ratio with budget of 32.3 uh, million US dollar this year. Next page, please. Uh, the scope of universal service is another topic we're discussing to cover broadband in rural areas. Currently, incumbent carriers are obliged to secure appropriate, fair and stable provision of fixed line public phone and emergency calls, and the deficit is covered by the universal service fund. Since last uh, April uh, last year, um, MIC has been holding an expert group study to discuss whether to include the broadband as universal service. The group is now discussing for the final report whether to propose fixed broadband as, as such as FTTH and cable to be pro provided nationwide as universal service. And I'm personally interested in, in how the discussion will end and come up with future-proof uh, mechanism for universal service. So to wrap up, next page, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Japan has been promoting connectivity and ensuring equal access for all to unleash full potential digital transformation by encouraging investment with modernized regulation and supporting unserved areas with comprehensive ICT development plans. Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to answer your questions. Uh, th thank you very much Aki for, for this comprehensive uh, presentation of the situation in Japan. Thank you very much. And let me now welcome Mr. Daniel Branado Cavalcanti. And he is a coordinator of telecommunication policy at the Ministry of Communication in Brazil. There, Daniel, how can policy and regulation in Brazil best unleash the full potential of connectivity for the digital transformation and ensure equal access to connectivity for all? Please, Daniel, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Bengt. And it is indeed a great pleasure to join you all for today's open forum session. Brazil is committed to bringing digital connectivity to all Brazilians in the next few years, a goal that is very well aligned with the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. We believe that by reaching the targets of SDG 9 in network infrastructure, we are effectively enabling goals such as SDG 4 in quality education, SDG 5 in gender equality, and SDG 10 in reducing inequalities. Brazil is striving to close the gaps in broadband coverage and digital inclusion as part of our national digital transformation strategy. Strategy covers both enablers of digital transformation, including network infrastructure, trust, and skills, as well as the data-driven digital transformation of the economy and of government services. Despite the challenges of a vast territory and large population, 
we are making significant progress in expanding network infrastructure and providing connectivity all over the country. The most recent numbers show that over 81% of households in Brazil have either fixed or mobile broadband service subscriptions. Internet use in homes is also noticeably gender balanced in Brazil with 79% of women and girls and 77% of men and boys using the internet. We'd like to briefly mention some examples of successful policies and regulation in telecoms in Brazil that actually promote competition and investment, increasing coverage and access to high quality broadband internet. First, on internet exchange points. In order to provide internet connectivity to service providers of all sizes, the country operates several open and neutral IXPs, where transit, peering, and access to CDNs is possible, and participation is on a voluntary basis. Most network operators with significant market power were not interested in participating since they operated their own exclusive exchange points where smaller networks connected to buy transit capacity. So we introduced an active policy of increasing participation in ISPs, including these major transit providers. This translated into regulation that required network operators with SMP to be present at all IXPs in their coverage area and to have a public reference offer for transit services at each location. Today, over half of all fixed broadband subscriptions in the country are provided by small and medium-sized ISPs. The national network infrastructure proved to be robust and resilient during the tremendous increase in traffic that took place over the last two years of the pandemic. Brazil's internet exchange is today one of the largest in the world, both in terms of peak traffic exchange and in number of participants. A second example comes from mobile broadband. In a country like Brazil, mobile connectivity, while not a substitute for fiber, must be part of the solution to provide affordable access to all. With 4G and even more so with 5G, mobile is a viable option for broadband internet service provision. In the recent 5G spectrum auction, Brazil put an emphasis on coverage requirements rather than revenue from spectrum licenses. Indeed, in the 5G auction, the winning bidders could deduct the estimated costs of the additional coverage obligations from the value of the bid. The result of this auction was that along with the five existing mobile operators, three national and two regional, the auction attracted five new entrants, one national and four regional. All coverage requirements would be met with a significant expansion of mobile coverage to rural villages and districts, public schools, and along federal highways. A third and last example is in fiber broadband network expansion. Of course, fiber infrastructure is an essential element of today's robust and resilient broadband networks. Brazil introduced regulation organizing the use of rights of way by implementing dig once policies, facilitating the deployment of fiber networks. And since the new mobile 5G networks will require the deployment of fiber backhaul, this prevents, presents an additional opportunity to promote sustainable fiber network expansion. So with that, I will stop here and looking forward to questions. Uh, thank you, Bengt. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel. And thank you for this and congratulations. Very positive outcome on, on the auction there. Uh, let me now please uh, welcome uh, Ms. Uh, Same Oladin Soltra, a security expert at BDO Solutions which has an impressive track record in the, in the private uh, connectivity sector. Dear Sam, how are you and your company supporting the aim of securing communication networks and make networks resilient to digital security risks? What will be uh, on the wish list to governments and regulators to pursue this goal? Please, Sam, do you have the floor? Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me on this uh, open forum. Um, I'm very proud to be here today. Uh, digital risks are growing every day uh, due to the high number of interactions and transactions that are being carried out on the internet, especially since, uh, since the pandemic. It's essential, as recommended in the recommendation on broadband connectivity, that adequate resources allocated to promote the improvement of digital skills for all users of the internet. As an example, a simulation of a phishing attack in a typical organization can get around 30% or more users to click on an insecure link. And around 20% of those users would actually give their username and passwords. This differs 
depending on the industry and the IT maturity level of the organization. Uh, for example, in banks, that should typically be a lot less because they have more training sessions and the users are more aware of, of the risks and they know, you know they have to be careful and call the IT department, for example. So cybersecurity awareness for us uh, is essential and how to use social media uh, for me would, should be included in school services and should be provided for free to adults and the media. I'm referring um, to the recommendation two, number six, which is promoting and investing in the improvement of digital skills to enable the effective use of broadband services by citizens of all outcomes, ages, genders, and abilities. Uh, and it continues to say that this should include facilitating the development of locally relevant and easy to use applications and content to increase usage and demand. Uh, to summarize the weakest security link in all networks and systems remain the people using them. And it's essential that we reduce the impact of social engineering. And to close that point, I'd like to point out you know, that uh, you know, to drive a car, we have to get a license and we get a training on how to go, uh, how to use a car. When we have a mobile phone or a computer system, we just switch it on and we start using it. So maybe we should invest um, a lot more uh, into training people before they, they start using internet. Okay, second, my second point I'd like to, to make would be about um, having a coordinated approach towards monitoring networks. I agree with recommendation three that uh, of the broadband, uh, recommendation broadband connectivity that we need to have policies in place to ensure that network service providers provide transparent reporting so that end users can make better choices. Network diversity for uplinks and redundancy and resilience in equipment and links are essential. Here, improvement in terms of processes, such as the enforcement of best practices based on ISO 27001 and ISO 22301 for business continuity, for example, for internet service providers can help create a more resilient and safer environment and reduce digital risk. Enforcement of digital privacy controls can also improve the security of our private information. The controls should not have a be limited to internet service providers, but should include uh, cloud service providers as well. They are prime entities in providing services and must provide reports and information on uh, no, any information on the level of resilience, redundancy, diversity that they provide for different regions. Um, okay, monitoring of data is a sensitive subject, and uh, but it's very useful. And I think we should be monitoring data through internet exchange gateways can be very useful in securing the internet. The use of artificial intelligence can make securing public networks proactive rather than reactive. Nowadays, uh, we have products that learn uh, through uh, behavior of different users and different uh, entities on the networks and can actually block uh, connectivity according to, you know, to specific applications or take other actions that we, we define. A peer-based collaboration between networks and cloud application service providers, application providers could help detect illegal activity and provide law enforcement with the right information. For example, we could imagine an AI appliance detecting a repeated sharing of children's photos and relaying that key information to Interpol, for example, for intervention. We have to be careful here on the limits of monitoring information on the internet and have a multi-stakeholder and transparent approach so that the data is not used for repression by some governments. We need to build a methodology and system that ensures transparent reporting for user information. Uh, resilience and security built in by design and based on best practices and enforce those legal requirements. And I'd like to insist here on the security by design. Unfortunately, from experience, we've seen that uh, security, especially cybersecurity is always an afterthought. It's only after attacks uh, that companies um, realize that they have to invest a lot more. Fortunately, um, this awareness is uh, rising and uh, it's predicted that more and more companies will be investing the tools and, and training and uh, for to increase cybersecurity on 
their premises. But um, I think uh, we need to keep that trend up and that uh, design in security in all the elements of the internet uh, must, must be done. Like, um, and it has to be enforced legally as well. So um, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the section three, which uh, the, of the broadband um, recommendation. So that would be that adherence take measures to ensure resilient, reliable, secure, and high capacity networks by publishing open, verifiable, granular, reliable subscription coverage and where available quality of service data through periodic reporting, uh, promoting measures to ensure resilience of communication networks, and taking measures, including legal measures, where necessary to secure communication networks and make those networks resilient to digital security risk. So that's all for me. And I'll look forward to questions afterwards. Thank you very much, uh, Sam, for these insights and also just underscoring the significance of, of uh, security by design. Certainly a very important topic and also, as you said, an important part of the recommendation. Thank you once again, uh, the panelists, for your contribution to the discussion. So we get a very short uh, view from Brazil, from Japan, and now from from uh, same here on the on the security aspects of of, of issues in cyber world and also uh, underlining the the recommendation. I would now like to open the floor to the audience to raise any questions or comments. So please raise your uh, your hand. And you can also use the, the chat function. Do we have any hand? Yes, we have a hand here. Lauren Green from, uh, from the OCD, please. Lauren. Hi, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers today. I actually have a question for the final speaker, um, Ms. Aludin Sohutu, and I'm very sorry for my mispronunciation perhaps. Uh, I was very interested in what you were saying about um, how IXPs can be a very interesting um, and important gateway to help secure communications. And I thought that the um, example that you put forward was very interesting. Could you expand on that just a little bit? Because it's something that uh, we at the OECD are thinking about, and I'd love to, to get a little bit more insights into how maybe that could, could actually happen in practice. Okay, thank you for giving me this opportunity, Lauren, because I think that's something that, that we really should be doing. Um, I won't mention the name, but uh, there's a product that we're implementing and that, um, and that actually works on corporate networks that we connect to core networks and that monitors all the users' activity in the network, for example, uh, you know, in a, in a whole network. So if you connect it to the core switch, um, it will monitor, for example, they will know that Zaim comes to work at nine, logs in and usually works for Mauritius. And that, uh, you know, that I use Outlook, I use Teams, and basically that's all I do all day. So, and uh, that, that device, that artificial de intelligence device actually knows my profile. And right now we're using it for security. So, uh, so for example, if someone has access to my username and password and logs in from Japan and at you know, 2 a.m. In, in, the, in the evening and uses Outlook or MS Teams, it might flag it, you know, that it's not the typical activity and it will flag it, you know, as a, a suspicious uh, connection. But if I come up with like a scripting, uh, I started do, doing a scripting session on my network, it will actually block that activity based on, on how we've defined it and how we've trained that artificial intelligence device. And um, so extrapolating from that, I think um, you know, at, at the internet exchange points, we actually have access to all, all the traffic that's going uh, through uh, the network in um, the internet in a country. So we could actually learn typical patterns and we could set rules that would allow us to understand. So we don't need to know what the person is actually doing. We don't need to get into the data packets, but we can, for example, look at 
you know, large amount of JPEGs being exchanged or um, look at typical patterns that would cause uh, you know, um, exchange of, uh, I'm, I'm really have photos in mind because I'm thinking of children and it's uh, like the topic of uh, this subject, but uh, there, are, there are many other you know, um, you know, law uh, aspects such as uh, DDoS attack, for example, or other cybersecurity uh, issues that, that could be detected by artificial intelligence. So, but, um, but this needs to be managed and, and has to be rule-based and we need to you know, define what we think is right and what we think is wrong and train that artificial intelligence entity uh, you know, over time so that we can make use of it. Does that answer your question, uh, Lauren? Thank you yeah. very much, Sam. And everything is clear to, to underscore that. Uh, are there no other? Uh, are there any other questions? I have one, but I'm just waiting to see if there's any raised hand. So, if not, uh, I will then uh, I would like to hear from a short view from you, Aki and Daniel. When it comes to, I mean, OECD and like in Europe and like in Sweden, where I come from, that we expect the markets to do the majority of investment, but in now we are in the digital transformation and this infrastructure becomes critical for society. So how do you see the, the responsibility for policymakers and, and the, the interplay here between market and, and public forces in, in the development going forward? Aki, what do you say from, from your point of view? Yeah, uh, Ben, thank you. For, thank you very much for your question. And there's a really uh, important question that we have always that we have to keep in mind that I think is... Uh, well, as you mentioned, that the, the investment by the private companies should be, you know, um, fully uh, protected or maybe uh, promoted with the our policy and the laws, uh, because uh, as you know, if there's no um, fair competition to investment uh, to invest the, the the network and also the the services, I think it won't be, uh, you know, it, we can't expect any uh, growth for the the service and for the disseminate the you know the. To, to meet the needs of the the, the the public, but at the same time that we have the this kind of you know kind of harsh situation, especially for the, during the COVID nineteen, and also if we have faced the difficulties in disseminating in the rural areas that is not this uh, with the disseminated areas, uh, we if we do, do nothing, uh, we we cannot do with the, the people living there. So I think we, we have to keep in mind as well that uh, if there is no, um, you know, how to say, the way to be served with the pub, uh, private companies alone, we could, you know, intervene and then do some um, fair, uh, how to say, the policy to, to, to help them support the having the infrastructure also uh, to, how to say, to help um, to make a uh, the service to be uh, uh, promoted. So I think that we have to both keep in mind that to, to keep the, the fair competition and also the if there's no, uh, you know, cannot be accepted the fair competition, we have to be, uh, you know, supportive with the more transparent and fair way. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Daniel, if you very shortly could say a few words on this from your perspective. Yes, uh, thank you. Very uh, briefly, from our perspective, with a country as vast as Brazil, although uh, broadband uh, service provision is driven by the private sector, there are limits to uh, market efficiency and sustainability of these services. So there is a role for policies and indeed for action uh, by the government. And I'll mention just briefly two. One is our Universal Services Fund has already been converted to uh, support uh, broadband as a, a universal service. And we indeed intend to provide to all. So in extreme uh, remote uh, locations, there is no market solution. So we provide government uh, provided uh, satellite broadband services to some of these locations. So it, indeed, it is a combination then of uh, the use of universal services funds to uh, promote expansion by the private sector, and as well 
direct provision of services by government because digital transformation is not only of the economy but also of government services. So it's in the interest of the government to provide uh, universal service. Thank you, I'll leave it here. Thank you very much. I uh, would like to thank again, uh, Mr. Akiko uh, Saki and Mr. Daniel Cavalcanti and uh, Ms. Same Olandin uh, Soltra for, for participating in this forum, this, the first part of the forum. So thank you very much for, for your participation. And we have reached the end of the first part of this uh, open forum. So I would like to thank you all, uh, the panelists and audience for this very, for this uh, discussion. And now hand over to, to the chair, uh, Gilmar uh, Roche, uh, to guide the second part of the, of the recommendation on children in the digital environment of this open forum. So please, the second part to begin. Uh, thank you, Bent. Uh, this is uh, Guilherme Rashki. Um, I'm counsel for international consumer protection at the Federal Trade Commission in the United States. And I'm also the vice chair of the OECD Working Party on Data Governance and Privacy and Digital Economy. A uh, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, it's morning here in Washington, DC. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here and moderate uh, the second part of this panel, which will focus on the OECD recommendation on children in the digital environment. This recommendation is a product of over four years of substantial analytical work with the participation of over 80 international experts. The recommendation's overriding goal is to find a balance between protecting children from risk and promoting the opportunities and ben benefits that the digital environment can provide. It includes overarching principles for a safe and beneficial digital environment, as well as guidance for governments in policymaking and in international cooperation. Without further ado, we will kick off this part of the meeting with a presentation from the OECD Secretariat on the recommendation. With that, it's my pleasure to hand over to Electra Ronki, head of the Data Governance and Privacy Unit in the Digital Economic Poli Economy Policy Division of the OECD to present the recommendation. Electra, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Guillaume. So what I wish to do in the next few minutes is provide um, an overview of the recommendation to further inform the discussion of this panel today. But let me backtrack briefly. Ensuring that children can benefit from a safe and secure digital environment has been a priority of the OECD for almost 15 years now. Since the declaration by OECD ministers in 2008 at the Seoul Ministerial for the Future of the Internet, Following this declaration, the OECD Council adopted in 2012, the recommendation on the protection of children online. If I can have the next slide, please. So in just a little more than a decade since its adoption, work by the OECD uncovered significant changes in children's online life and in the digital environment. And much of this change is due to both the growth in the use of mobile devices, as well as change patterns of use. Since 2012, for example, there's been a 50% rise in 12 to 15 year olds owning smartphone devices. And globally, an estimated one in three internet users today is a child. And even more importantly, compared to 2012, the digital environment has become an integral part of children's everyday lives and interactions. On average, across the OECD in 2018, 15 year olds spent 35 hours per week online. Now, the benefits can be tremendous. The digital environment can support children's education, enhance their creativity, and provide social and cultural opportunities. Children are today enthusiastic users of social media apps and are more prone to sharing self-generated content than, we know, than before. The next slide, please. Now, at the same time, our work shows that along with the evolution in the type and the frequency of children's online use, new risks have emerged. And the change patterns of use have in turn changed the frequency, the nature, and the scale of existing risks. We have developed a typology of risks, which provides useful guidance to government on these issues. The typology recognizes four main risk categories, content and conduct risks, content and consumer risk. The ease and variety of ways in which children can be contacted in the digital environment has changed the frequency and intensity of risks such as cyberbullying and sexual exploitation. 
and extensive use of social media has raised concerns regarding children's health and well being. There are also concerns about body image disorders that can be exacerbated by frequent exposure to unrealistic and altered images on social media. And we know that girls are particularly prone to this. There are also rising concerns that too much time online could be harmful for children. The next slide, please. In the highly commercialized digital environment where personal data has become a commodity, children are also increasingly exposed to significant privacy risks. As a result of advanced technologies such as artificial intelligence and predictive analytics, children's data may be used for the purpose of profiling, potentially affecting their fundamental legal rights and freedoms. For example, predictive analytic models may inadvertently bias certain subgroups of children. And I think that the COVID pandemic has accelerated these trends, identifying the different risks that children may face in the digital environment and how to best respond to them has been an OECD priority. We also carried out an extensive review of the legal and policy environment, which showed that responses are fragmented and have not always kept pace with advances in technology and are not always based on sound evidence. The next slide, please. Now, the revised recommendation on children in the digital environment is a response to the significantly changed digital landscape. The recommendation, which as um, Guillaume noted, benefited from extensive multi-stakeholder consultation and the input of a dedicated international group of experts to whom we're very, very grateful, was adopted on, May, on 31 May 2021 by the OECD Ministerial Council meeting. The recommendation's principal goal is to find a balance between protecting children from risk and promoting the opportunities and benefits that the digital environment can provide. In particular, the recommendation highlights the urgency of protecting children's privacy and personal data and calls for an age-appropriate child safety by design and for measures which are proportionate, respectful of rights and promote inclusion. It encourages multi-stakeholder cooperation. The slide before you provides a very, you know, glance overview of the different sections of the recommendation. As you can see, it includes overarching principles for safe and beneficial digital environment, as well as guidance for government and policymaking and in international cooperation. I already mentioned some of the principal principles in the first section. Let me just move to the second section on overarching where um, the recommendation aims to provide guidance to governments uh, in setting a policy framework. It calls for career and policy, effective legal measures and evidence-based responses. It promotes digital literacy as an essential tool and the adoption of measures which provide for an age-appropriate child safety by design. And lastly, the section on international cooperation highlights the importance of international regional networks and seeks to promote continued collaboration and the development of shared standards as well as information sharing. Now, the next slide, please. Alongside the recommendation, the OCD developed guidelines specifically directed at digital service providers in recognition of the essential role they play in providing a safe and beneficial digital environment. The guidelines have been developed uh, with, to support digital service providers in taking actions that may directly or indirectly affect children in the digital environment, that is in providing services directed at children and those that may not be necessarily have been shaped to be directed at children, but which children are using in reality and access in reality. The guidelines are intended to complement the recommendation and to be read in conjunction with it. And there is a link between the two documents with each referring to the other. Now I will end there and I'm happy to take any questions um, on this presentation and look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Electra, uh, for this important presentation on the OECD recommendation. We'll now turn to our panelists who will present uh, their views in creating a safe and beneficial digital environment for children. With that, let me turn to our first panelist, uh, Brian O'Neill, who's Professor Emeritus at the Technological University Dublin. Brian, you recently joined Minister Catherine Martin of Ireland to launch a report of national survey of children, their parents and adults regarding online safety. One of the key takeaways of the report 
that there are often significant differences across different age categories of children in terms of the nature of their engagement with their online environment, the online risks they encounter, and the resilience in the face of those risks. The OECD's typology of risks, which underpins the recommendation, also underlines that the age and maturity of children may affect their ability to understand risks, for instance, to their privacy. Can you share your views on how we can support children with different age, maturity, and circumstances to better understand the risks of the digital environment and how they can be protected and empowered? You know, May, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you indeed um, uh, for the opportunity to join this uh, important panel uh, on the OECD recommendation for children in the digital environment. Uh, I'm delighted to be speaking to you from Dublin, uh, Ireland. And yes, as you've mentioned, uh, recently our minister uh, with responsibility for the communications area launched uh, our report, uh, uh, which surveyed uh, children, parents and adults. And I should say that this is in the context of uh, a National Advisory Council for Online Safety, uh, which the Minister chairs, and I, in fact, am the, uh, the Deputy Chair, and it sponsored this research very much in the spirit, as Eletra has pointed out, uh, in terms of developing evidence-based policies. And so with research such as this, um, it is, in fact, uh, a further iteration of the EU Kids Online uh, survey in Ireland, uh, so that we now have a database uh, of uh, 20 countries um, uh, with up-to-date data as of 2020 uh, regarding their experiences of uh, both opportunities and risks uh, in the digital environment. And this uh, will be alongside uh, the hugely significant uh, guidance which the OECD recommendation uh, presents, affords uh, opportunities for stakeholders and for governments informing uh, good policies um, uh, for uh, uh, the future uh, digital environment. So I'll just say a few words uh, about um, our research findings uh, and uh, how it um, uh, amplifies some of the messages uh, which Eletra uh, presented uh, uh, in her uh, overview uh, of the recommendation. And then say a little bit uh, also about uh, legislative uh, proposals from the Irish government uh, which uh, seek to uh, bring forward uh, key principles of safety by design uh, and encouraging um, uh, uh, responsible uh, behaviour by digital uh, service uh, providers. So in this context, uh, you, as you've mentioned, uh, age, maturity, circumstance, all matter uh, uh, to a great extent in how children uh, uh, attain benefits uh, from the digital space. And uh, our survey certainly endorsed that. Now, the vast majority of children uh, gain hugely uh, from their online engagement and participation. Uh, and uh, you know, that is the case that as uh, children become uh, ever more uh, active uh, online, uh, there is so much to be gained, particularly as uh, we gathered much of our data over the course of significant restrictions uh, when socialization and education could really only take uh, place uh, online. Uh, also, as uh, noted, uh, that uh, 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 children uh, are digitally active from an ever earlier age. Uh, our survey findings uh, are from age nine uh, to 17, uh, but uh, we're increasingly conscious that we need more and better evidence of how younger children uh, are experiencing uh, uh, digital uh, participation. Uh, but uh, you know, in, in, our er uh, in our findings, we know that uh, uh, children from age nine upwards uh, have have increasing autonomy in terms of ownership of their own devices, typically smartphones and tablets, and 40% uh, of our nine-year-olds, uh, for example, uh, uh, have their own device. Uh, and with that, uh, what is clearly evident uh, from our uh, research findings is that there is still a ladder of opportunities. And by this, I mean uh, that not all children gain equally uh, from uh, 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 opportunities available uh, to them. And uh, they slowly uh, uh, graduate uh, through different levels of relatively passive uh, consumption uh, or communication activities uh, to uh, attaining more uh, participative and creative uh, online opportunities. 
Of course, a, a key feature of uh, uh, research um, uh, such as ours and through EU Kids Online is to highlight uh, those experiences of risk uh, that really mitigate uh, children enjoying uh, benefits uh, online. And uh, exposure to uh, potentially harmful content uh, is something that has been very much uh, in focus. And that was uh, something that our uh, research has something to say about, uh, and that uh, uh, one in four uh, children uh, report being exposed to varying categories uh, of har harmful content. Uh, we've heard listing of some of these and the typology of risks in the OECD recommendation, you know, gives a, a very helpful guide in this. Uh, one in five have seen hate messages. Uh, one in four uh, have been exposed and have been upset by, by gory or violent content uh, online. Um, um, uh, 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 eating disorders uh, is an area of online content uh, which is of concern and uh, while one in ten or just over ten percent uh, of children overall uh, have uh, seen or uh, uh, accessed content of this nature it again adversely affects significant uh, numbers of girls rising uh, to nearly one in uh, four or uh, 23 percent uh, for teenage girls so these these are certainly uh, concerns in relation to access uh, to potential um, uh, harmful content. Um, contact and conduct risks uh, remain uh, persistent themes reported by children uh, to be distressing and uh, certainly, as I say, mitigate against uh, availing of uh, positive uh, online opportunities. And uh, cyberbullying is a complex phenomenon, uh, but uh, what our research uh, shows that uh, it uh, particularly affects um, uh, 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 teenagers of particular age at transition points as they, where they are relatively new uh, to socializing online uh, and to engaging in social media type environments. Uh, and uh, you know, this is an area uh, that requires targeted measures and support, uh, both in terms of you know, better safety uh, design arrangements, but also in terms of uh, education. Um, also, as highlighted in the typology of risks, uh, you know, the area of uh, uh, contract or consum uh, consumer risks uh, is a relatively new area for research. Uh, but what we're finding is that uh, too few children are able to manage uh, privacy in such contexts uh, or have sufficient awareness uh, of uh, the potential risks uh, to their data or how their data may be misused uh, within contexts where uh, they don't have sufficient consumer literacy uh, regarding uh, these areas. So this is a broad base of um, uh, research findings, uh, which we uh, have uh, as up-to-date evidence to support uh, the policymaking effort. Uh, and that uh, refers to the Irish context, but it is also a wider European uh, data set. And as I say, you know, the comparative nature of that uh, becomes uh, quite important. Uh, but all of this is really quite significant in terms of, you know, as uh, governments and uh, OECD member states uh, think through uh, their policy frameworks. And this, of course, is a key part of uh, the recommendation. Uh, Ireland uh, is proposing new uh, legislation in the form of an online safety and media regulation bill. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, uh, again, within the European Union context uh, is in part uh, transposing uh, the audiovisual media services directive uh, at a European context and provides uh, enhanced uh, protections for children in the area of video sharing platforms uh, and uh, 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 platforms uh, uh, which provide access uh, to children uh, uh, to different kinds of content. Uh, uh, there is uh, an additional dimension. Brian, uh, thank you. Could I ask that you uh, uh, give some wrapping up remarks, please? Yes, so indeed. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the, so our, our policy frameworks and developing legislative um, uh, approaches here uh, have the aim of enhancing and supporting uh, safety by design, as I say, and uh, you know, it puts in place uh, proposed regulatory frameworks, uh, which will allow for uh, safety codes uh, to be developed by industry. And again, the guidance for digital service providers uh, in the recommendation are a key instrument in relation to that. And uh, a media commission, 
uh, which hosts an online safety commissioner, uh, which will have the opportunity to audit and indeed to apply sanctions uh, where such safety codes are, uh, are, are not adhered to. So in this broader context, the OECD recommendation is not only timely, but hugely important and influential. Uh, and uh, we hope uh, that uh, it, if you like, uh, provides the context for wider international cooperation in developments such as these. And on that, I'll hand the, uh, the, uh, uh, the floor back to you, Guillermo, and thank you for the opportunity. I thank you, Brian, for these uh, important remarks and for highlighting uh, your research and evidence base. Uh, now let me turn to Alexandre Barboza, who is the head of the Center of Studies for Information and Communications Technology in Brazil. Alexandre, uh, a research project conducted in Brazil highlighted that digital divide is still a key concern in the country, which especially affects low-income households in rural areas. The COVID-19 pandemic has also highlighted the need to establish enabling and equitable conditions for all children, which can both ensure access and protect them from harm. Can you tell us some relevant statistics from Brazil that you collected on the access of children to the digital environment and on the digital divide? And in particular, what percentage of children have access to digital technologies in Brazil? Thank you, Guilherme. Good morning, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, let me start by congratulating the OECD and the LETRA for leading this important and timely recommendation on children in the digital environment. Well, uh, the, it, this is a real pleasure because we had the opportunity and privilege to participate in the expert group of this recommendation. Well, Guilherme, uh, Brazil, um, as you mentioned, is producing regular statistical data on the access to and uh, use of digital technologies by children since 2012 on an annual basis. It's a national uh, representative survey uh, and this uh, Brazilian Kids Online survey is fully compliant with the methodological frameworks, uh, both from the European Kids Online and the UNICEF Global Kids Online uh, frameworks. So we have uh, internationally comparable, comparable comparability data. So um, as we've heard uh, previously from my colleague Guilherme, uh, sorry, Daniel Cavalcanti, the internet connectivity scenario in the country has much evolved in the last years and mobile broadband does play an important role in promoting connectivity. However, we still uh, have some inequalities in the country marked by urban versus rural and socioeconomic gaps. And although uh, we have 83% of the households connected, uh, some relies only on mobile connectivity and without computers, for instance, any type of computers. And if you consider the ideal scenario of having broadband and computers, we have only 41% of children aged nine to 17 years old living in households with computers uh, access, but uh, without any type of uh, computers, relying only on mobile devices. And when we look at the dynamics of the internet use among this young population, we find that 89% of internet users um, are young uh, children and adolescents, a proportion that represents about 24 million children in the country using internet. Uh, and although advances in connectivity has been observed, digital divides persists in some socioeconomic strata and regions. Uh, the proportion of internet users were much lower in rural areas and in the North Amazon region and Northeast regions of, of the country, and of course, in low income households. In absolute numbers, uh, these represent 3 million students not having internet access at all. And uh, we still have 16.5 million students living in households with limited um, internet access, either without any connectivity at all or with limited download speed below four megabits per second. So uh, if you look at uh, uh, low socioeconomic status population, there is a high uh, proportion of users that have only mobile access via Wi-Fi connections without any 3G or 4G data packets. And this uh, we could link with uh, the concept of meaningful connectivity. You have to have broadband and uh, devices, not only mobile devices. So the absence of internet access in the household 
uh, was the main reason for not going online, which was reported by 1.6 million children. This represents about 6% of the Brazilian population um, aged 9 to 17 years old. Thank you, Alexander. If I could ask that you wrap up, please, so we have yeah. only a few minutes right. left for the last speaker. So um, the final message here is that um, people using uh, only internet uh, access via mobile, uh, this represents uh, a great challenge because it does impose several implications to digital skills development, online opportunities, and of course, parental mediation and exposure to risks and harms. I will stop here, Guilherme. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, and so if I could turn now to our last speaker, Amelia Vance, who's Director of Youth and Education Privacy at the Future Privacy Forum. Uh, one of your areas of expertise is the unintended consequences of laws and regulations meant to protect children, primarily in the United States. Um, how can governments establish more enabling and equitable conditions for children to ensure that they can realize the benefits of the digital environment. Uh, and if I could ask that you limit your remarks to one or two minutes, I'm sorry, uh, but we're out of, uh, almost out of time. Thank you. No problem at all. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm honored to be in the presence of so many uh, brilliant people working on these issues. Uh, so, uh, as mentioned, one of my areas of expertise is on unintended consequences. So, I track uh, the student and child privacy laws in the U.S. and to some extent globally and uh, was honored to be part of the expert working group tasked with revising uh, the recommendation. Uh, over the past eight years in the U.S., we've seen over 130 new student privacy laws uh, passing in 40 states uh, with well over a thousand at this point introduced in states across the U.S. Uh, and I think about 15 federally. Uh, and we've seen from that uh, many examples of both best practices and lessons learned. Um, and we've seen that well-intentioned actions can result and have resulted in unintended consequences. So for example, in 2014, uh, the Louisiana legislature passed a law to protect student privacy, which required parents to approve nearly any collection and sharing of student data with no student information shared without a parent's express permission. Uh, and the law involved jail time, involved fines if there was even a mistake. Um, schools afraid of prisoner fines uh, were so concerned that they stopped allowing school photographs without uh, consent, stopped announcing uh, sport player names at games, uh, stopped hanging student artwork in the hallway. Um, all unintended consequences of a well-intentioned effort to protect student privacy. Okay. I'll add just one more point. Um, the, you can also have unintended consequences on the other side of this, where it, efforts aimed at protecting children from risk can cause unintended consequences. So we've seen in Florida, for example, uh, attempts to minimize and mitigate violence by requiring schools to inquire about student mental health status uh, when registering for school or uh, implementing social media monitoring at a state level all of which has had unintended consequences for students with disabilities uh, and other students who pose no threat of violence, um, but Hi. are now being more heavily Hi. monitored. Amelia, thank you very much for these comments and thank you for highlighting these unintended consequences. I do wanna give the floor to Audrey Plonk, head of the digital economy policy at the OECD for her concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Guilherme, and um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, I won't, I'll be very brief, I, I guess I'll say, um, in the interest of time, I want to first thank our speakers as well as our panelists for their insights into these two very important topics and for connecting these two very important milestone recommendations that came from the OECD this year, one on how to protect children and one on how to advance connectivity. Because as we've seen that, uh, you know, as we try to, to bridge digital divides and have better connectivity and, and make access more fair and equitable, we also have uh, increased risks in some areas, particularly uh, to children and to minors. And I am very inspired by the uh, incredibly passionate people here um, 
trying to tackle that issue, trying to gather real hard uh, data and evidence about what the benefits and the risks are, because there's obviously um, a lot of a lot of fear and a lot of hype, um, which is important. It's also important to, to, to acknowledge the positives and the risks and to find the right balance. So I really um, I really very much welcome this dialogue and uh, want to commend uh, both our moderators, Galerme and Bent, who are both involved in our work at the OECD, and um, commend you both for your leadership in, in making our recommendations uh, come to the light this year. It's been a big year for us, as well as for um, uh, for, for again, for connecting these two really important issues together. Um, in the interest of time, and because I, I know that uh, that we're supposed to wrap up here in one minute. I just uh, I will thank the panelists collectively rather than individually, and and just say that um, that uh, it's been a really uh, impressive lineup of of expertise here uh, for the IGF from across the world. And as I think our 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 chair of CIS said at the beginning, it is a it is a global we're a global community here trying to solve. Uh, both uh, connectivity divides as well as protecting children in that in that process. Um, I just uh, I want to close by um, thanking all of you who have participated in the OECD work. Invite you to look at our recommendations. Um, we'd love to work with you and hear from you on how to advance these uh, important issues in the future. And with that, um, I'll thank you all for your time and wish you an excellent uh, ending to the IGF. As there's still a another day or so to go. Lots of rich content out there. <laughs>